Good afternoon. I'm Dara Bunjan. I'm the food enthusiast here at Jaymore Living. I'm a food writer, food stylist, PR maven, and a frustrated baker. Those of you joining us live, drop your questions for our guests or for me in the comment box, and I will check from time to time. Today's guest is best-selling author Amy Riolo, who wears many hats. Chef, television host, Mediterranean lifestyle ambassador, food historian, culinary anthropologist, culinary diplomat, restaurant consultant, international tour leader. And if that isn't enough, she has her 12th book being released March 14th, Quick and Easy Mediterranean Recipes, Delicious Recipes from the World's Healthiest Diet. There's Amy. Hi, welcome, Amy. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for squeezing us in in your very busy schedule. It's a so pleasure. Other than, other than our show today, what else do you have on your plate? Well, I just got a new contract for my 14th book. So I have to <laughs> delve into that and, and make sure that uh, everything's ready to go, get that signed. I also have some uh, media interviews to respond to, like the, the questionnaires that they send you out and fill out, things like that. I'm editing uh, book number 13. And so that needs, that, that's, that's, you have to love ha editing. If you're going to be a writer, you have to love editing, but it's always a little bit painful to, to go through these edits. So I have to do that. And um, when that gets done, I get to promote my products. So um, it's, a, it's a pretty busy day. Well, you are the woman who wears, like I said, many, many hats. I'd like my viewers to get to know a little bit about my guest background. So that's what we're going to do. I want to go back in time. You went to Cornell University for fashion. Correct. What was the inspiration for the change of careers? Well, I studied apparel and textile management at Cornell. I always loved fashion. I like to say that fashion is my first love. And to be honest with you, I love it for the same reasons that I love food. Um, I've never, I don't look at it as that I changed careers. I just kind of switched mediums um, because what I okay. loved about fashion was, you know, not the sense of luxury and the monetary value and that kind of thing. It was more about the craftsmanship and the beauty and the way that you could, you know, portray a culture and different places and, and, you know, just all of these, th these things that make life better through, through clothing. So that's what I loved about fashion. Uh, food was just something that we always did in my family. It was, it was entertainment. It was a chore. It was a lifestyle. It was something that you had to do to eat. And so I kind of took it for granted and I never really thought that I could make a career out of it because in those days they weren't, there weren't, a, I, I wasn't seeing at least a lot of female chefs in restaurants, or I didn't know any cookbook authors. The internet wasn't a thing. So blogging and all of this stuff wasn't around yet. Um, and I knew that I didn't want to be in a restaurant in four walls in, back in the kitchen. I, I wanted to be out in the world and traveling. So I just, I never thought of food as a career. I thought of it as something that women did. Um, and, you know, even, and I knew I didn't want to cater. So that wasn't a thing. And later on in life, it just kind of all started coming together for me. The times were changing and I had spent time with my relatives <clears throat> in Italy. And I realized that they were much healthier than my relatives here. And so I said, you know, there's something to be said about the Mediterranean diet and the way that they eat, but there's also a lot of lifestyle things that don't get translated across the pond because you can eat the same foods in two different places, but they're giving you different results. And how can people bring a little bit more of that Mediterranean essence of living and the culture into their daily lives here to live with both pleasure and health? That became my thing. And so I said, I'm going to start writing a cookbook. And I did. And then, but I went through a very serious uh, health issue myself, a health condition. And I was legally disabled for three years, like in bed, um, on disability, just not able to move or to do much. And that was the real cathartic moment because I said, if I live, there's, I'm got to be here for a reason. And if I live, I'm going to do something meaningful and that, you know, to help other people. And so that became my goal. And that gave me kind of the, the chops, the guts <laughs> to go after a career change because it's hard, you know, to build all the way up from you don't have a degree in something, nobody knows that you know anything about something and you have to learn, you have to study, you have to do stages, you have to travel, you have to get a you know a bio made for yourself of actual things that you've done in a new career after you've healed. And so, um, but that's what, that's a long story short. And that's what I did. Right. Um, you actually got 
I believe, a second degree from Maryland University of Integrative, Integrative Health. Um, how has that impacted your work? So I didn't actually study there. I got a, a degree, what I call an integrative health from the School of Life, because I used integrative health to transform my illness. So I had stage three Lyme disease. And in stage four, um, I had it for many years and went undetected. And so by the time I was diagnosed, it was really bad and nobody could help me. I'd gone to Johns Hopkins and Georgetown and all the best you know, schools, universities, hospitals. No one knew what to do. Finally, I fell upon an integrative doctor, uh, Dr. Norton Fishman, who I love and, and revere to this day. And he said, I'm gonna to put together a team of professionals for you to help you because I know how serious this is. I know what you've got and I, des I think you have a shot. And he did. And each of these professionals were different professionals within integrative health. So I became a professional patient for three years and did everything I could. That's what I call myself to, to heal. And, and I got a, I got a, you know, a very unwanted degree without going to school. Fast forward years later, when my, when my culinary career took off, I was doing a lecture for the National Italian American Foundation at, during the pandemic. And I met Dr. John Rosa, who's on the board at the MUIH. And he said, you know, I think you've got a lot of synergy with us. Let's talk. So I started teaching uh, online classes with them and doing some different marketing things. And then I became their brand ambassador. And so I'm still working with them as a brand ambassador. We do uh, Wellness Wednesday podcasts and I write blogs for them and things like that. Great. Um, I met you probably when you had first done first or second cookbook. Now, Correct. what was surprising to me in looking at it, the first book was what? Arabian Nights? Arabian? Arabian Delights. Yeah. Delights. Um, one would think that, you know, how involved you got with your Calabrian grandmother and all the recipes that you learned from her, that maybe the first book would have been Italian. Why was it more Arabian, Egyptian, those types of flavors? Thank you so much for asking that question, Dara, because nobody ever does. And it's, it's important. Um, and it tells a lot about our um, food industry, how it's changed, how this profession views people. When I started out, I was trying to publish my grandmother's recipes. I had cookbooks on Calabria. I had Italian cookbooks. I tried to get gigs as an Italian chef, as an Italian American chef. Um, you know, I was very proud of the fact that I can speak both languages and, and there were a lot of people in that role that were not and, or were from different regions. And I said, you know, Italy's got a, 20 different regions. We've got America, a lot of Italian Americans. There's different things. It doesn't need to be one voice. But at that time they said, oh, you know, there's Mario Batali. Oh, there's Giada. Oh, there's uh, another person. And so we don't need you. We've got an Italian. Basically, if I applied somewhere and there was already another Italian chef, I couldn't work there because they thought that there couldn't be two chefs of the same ethnicity. And you know, nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, they could be 10 Jewish chefs and they could all have a different point of view and they're all needed and they're part of the story. Right. Same thing with Italy, same thing with Spain or Mexico or wherever. But um, we have this thing with ethnic food in America that there can only be one person talking about it. So I could never get work and I had to support myself and I had to, um, I wanted to move forward in this career. And so I just kept trying and I kept getting a lot of rejections. And at that point, I also started promoting. I said, okay, well, I can't talk just about Italy. I'll talk about the whole Mediterranean. Because Calabria is kind of like the core of the Mediterranean. It's a lot of the same principles. And I lived and worked in different places. So I started promoting the Mediterranean things. And at that time, they said, you know, you're not very well known. Um, why, why is your Mediterranean book better than someone else's? And so again, I would say, well, I've lived and worked in different places. I speak different languages. You know, nobody wanted anything. And I got 50 rejections for my first cookbook, by the way. So is that all? Yeah, yeah that's it. And I just kept going because I'm stubborn. And um, finally, Cooking Light magazine read my bio. And I don't know, they saw I was doing something. And they said, we consider you to be a North African expert. Would you, would you, you know, consider me write a Moroccan article for us? So I said, sure. And then um, at that same time, I was pitching, a, I pitched the Italian book to a publisher. They said, no, I pitched a Mediterranean book. They said, no. And then I got the chance to go to Saudi Arabia with the Royal Protocol and uh, stay in palaces when I was there. And the cooking was the furthest thing from my mind because I never thought I'd be writing about a cuisine I didn't grow up in. And my publisher got wind of it after they rejected me. And they said, you know, do you have any other ideas? And I was like, look, no, I'm in a palace in Saudi Arabia. Like food is the last thing on my mind right now. And they said, you're what, you're where, that's the book we want. And so I ended up staying and kind of combining it with the research that I had done when I was writing a book about Egypt. 
and um, it just it became its own thing. They had originally wanted to combine my Arabian Delights book with my Nile style book because they, in their mind, Arabic speaking, you know, all the same, whatever, they want to lump it together. But I really um, stuck to my my ground and I said, no, I want them to have be two separate books because they're two separate cultures and it's better. And so that's what I did. So my first book that came out was Arabian Delights, Recipes and Princely Entertaining Ideas from the Arabian Peninsula. And it covered all the Arabian Peninsula and I wanted to cover all the people that were there. So, you know, you have menus for a Yemenite Sabbath dinner that talks a lot about the Jewish faith in the Arabian Peninsula, which doesn't get a lot of, you know, talk. And then um, you also have um, like kind of prehistoric type things, which nobody knows about the depth of history that's in this land. And then you have more modern things and you have like Ramadan dinners and stuff. So I figured with that book, Americans know so little about um, the Arabian Peninsula. Let me introduce the culture. So it's a very cultural culinary format. And that is this book right here. And then from that, it did well. Uh, Washington Post, Bonnie Benwick, our friend Bonnie Benwick gave me a great review. And then um, they allowed me to publish my second book, which was Nile style um, Egyptian cuisine and culture. So this was the first ed edition of that book. This was the one that got 50 rejections. Um, luckily, it went on to win the World Gourmand Award in Paris for best Arab cuisine. It's also all cultural culinary format. So you start out in ancient times, Pharaonic times, you talk about the Jewish population in um, that was in, in very important, obviously in uh, Egypt. I went to the Ben Ezra synagogue, which is where Moses was found in the basket um, and all the way trace that history through time. Then we did the Christians. Then I did um, the different Islamic caliphates that were in Egypt all the way to modern times also in there. That one did really well and went into second print. I got to present it at the National Book Festival. Um, and then because those did well, I met up um, actually in Chicago when we were in Chicago together with the people from the American Diabetes Association and that right. led to the Mediterranean books. So when did you, you, you did Italian food for dummies. Yes. Did the people who do the dummies book reach out to you or did you reach out to them? Well, it's a lot, it's kind of an interesting story. I was um, working with the American Diabetes Association and in need of a project. And I pitched a, a something to them that they weren't ready to do at the time, but they said, we need someone to edit this quick diabetic recipes for dummies book. And so you, you won't technically be working with dummies. You'll be working with us, but you'll be um, editing the imprint. And so I got used to them. It was a great, Great, great gig. And um, we went our separate ways and I went back to work doing more work with the American Diabetes Association. Well, during the pandemic, the, the ADA said that they weren't going to publish books anymore. And I was their, their kind of like, you know, go-to author and they were my go-to publisher. And so it was really devastating because I thought, you know, at least during the pandemic, I'll write more books. You know, what can I do now? So I sat on it. It was holiday season. And I said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let myself enjoy the holiday and then I'll deal with this dilemma in January. And I did. And then in January, I reached out to them and said, since you all are going out of business, you know, do you think there is there anyone you would recommend that I work with? And they say, hey, you know, why don't you reach out to the, the dummies imprint again with Wiley? Because um, you had a good experience with them. And so I reached out to my current editor, who I love and who is amazing. And I said, look, um, you know, I, she said, I remember you. We had a good experience. And I said, I have about 26 more titles that I want to write in my life. <laughs> and I'm looking for a is that all? And she said, let's hear it. And so we started and then they, they came to me with their list. And so now we're blending like the books that were on my list with the books that are on their list. And, and it's great. I love working with them. And I never thought I would. Every time I say I do it, I do a dummies book, people laugh. But, you know, they let me write what I think is important. They really, more than any other publisher, have given me a, a clear voice. A and, and it's a brand people know. Yes. It's it's recognizable. Oh. Uh, we have we have some comments here from Cindy Silver. She says, I didn't know that about Amy. No wonder she always looks fantastically dressed. Then she comes back. Amy is an amazing woman. I've wanted to take one of her food cultural tours for a few years. Calabria or the Blue Zone of Greece. Awesome. So Wonderful. we will tell people we're not in any particular order okay. that. Amy does cultural tours and mm -hmm. anything you want to know about her is on her website. It's simple. Amy Riolo. And if you don't know how to spell Riolo, R-I-O-L-O. -O. So amyriolo.com. Go in. Um, she is running in May, a Calabrian 
uh, Cuisine, Culture, and Wine Tour, May 7th to the 15th. Nine days, eight nights. Do you still have any openings? The day is actually the deadline. So if anybody is interested, um, don't write to me later and say, how come you didn't do any Italian trips? Like <laughs> This is the deadline. So go register, and then you have until the end of the month to uh, pay the full deposit. But we are going in May. It's an amazing time to go in Calabria. And if you're an Italy lover, but you probably haven't been to that region yet, it's a wonderful place to discover because it's the root of Magna Grecia. I love it because it's my homeland, but it was also you know the place that Pythagoras taught at and that the, the Greeks called Greater Greece and there's so much beauty, culture, history, um, good food, wineries, and things that we're going to explore that I know that whoever signs up will be very happy. Well, I'd love to do it, but I've got, got other arrangements at that time. It'll come together. But, but we'll, we'll do something. I have to tell people you brought up um, we were at IACP, which International Association of Culinary Professionals. Yes. I just left Van Spices and I was trying to say which organization I'm going to stick with. And we shared a room. Sheila Kaufman, another author, was with us. And I, rem I can't remember where we went for dinner, but I remember getting in the cab and you looked at the driver and you start speaking to him in Arabic, and I'm going, this girl's in <laughs> You speak what? <laughs> French, <laughs> French, Italian, Greece. I'm still learning Greek. I got a long way to go with Greek. English, Arabic. Yeah. Am I missing anything? Or Spanish. Yeah. Right. You know, I can't do English. So I, I'm always impressed. I have friends. Jeffrey, who always watches a lot of the shows, and he says, you know what, we're a couple slackers. You bring these people on that multi-talented, multi-degree, he says, we're really slackers. No. You know, but I'm just so impressed by people, the joy of doing the show and um, letting people see in-depth aside to certain people, the humor, the love, what they've accomplished. Um, well, we all have our own set of things that we love and things that we have to do and i you know as i mentioned to you behind the scenes i'll mention it to you uh, you know while we're in the show because it's so amazing you have always been such an inspiration to me because the amount of people that you've worked with the amount of places that you've been to the di different types of food knowledge that you have and for people outside of this industry i don't think they realize you know in, in order to be in food you have to have knowledge of science mathematics history culture you have to be a social person you have to know how to cook you, you know there's so many different aspects of food and you've been involved in every one of them in all different places in in the u.s and for many many years and so like you're like a walking encyclopedia yourself and maybe maybe the language wasn't needed in your your part and my, for what I do, in order for me to, you know, stand up and say, hey, you know, I wrote this Egyptian book, I, I couldn't do that if I didn't have knowledge of the language. And, um, and, I, and also, it's very important to me to portray these cultures and, and in the Mediterranean, like, my goal before I die, I would like to learn all the languages of Mediterranean. So like, I want to learn, I want to, first of all, continue with my Greek, but then I also want to learn Hebrew, I want to learn Turkish. Um, I want to really know all those languages, because in knowing them, you get such a better depth of knowledge of the culture and of the food. It, it's um, it's just another, they, the two go hand in hand. And um, and it, it adds beautiful richness to your life because you can be different people. You can express different parts of yourself in different languages. You know, it's um, it's amazing. Like you say the same thing, but it's, I, if you just told me, okay, do that in Italian, do that in French, do that, it, I become different because it's uh, the languages give you that permission. Right. Um, I want to get into some fun things. You were asked by CNN to create a fantasy wedding menu for Prince William. Yes. Do you remember any of the dishes that you created? That was so fun. I do, actually. I was in Egypt at the time. Um, I was doing restaurant consulting there. And I got this. First, I thought it was spam. I was like, no way. This is just so crazy. And I looked at the other chefs, and they were much you know, older than I was. They were Michelin star chefs. And... And I didn't even have a restaurant. And I was like, why would they want my opinion? But they they wanted this like Mediterranean person's approach. And so I looked at them. I did a lot of research on the couple, where they got engaged, what they did. And I said, I want to 
you know, it's about them. It's their wedding, so I want to make this about them. So I remember I did uh, one of the things was um, they they both love pasta, and I think they got engaged or they had a romantic trip in Italy or somewhere. So I did corzetti pasta, which are the pasta from the Liguria region of, of Italy that are like flat discs, and they have a a stamp. But instead of you know, I was like, they're the royal family. Like, the, who? What better stamp to use? So it was like with the royal family stamp. And then I had, uh, there was uh, a coffee and fried like uh, fritter, um, so they start with a B, they're from uh, Nairobi, because I think they had they had some love of Nairobi and going there too. So they wanted to have this stand where they could have those fritters and, and that style coffee. And then the chocolate had to be from, from Italy, from Amade, because they, at the time they were like the best Italian company that was doing fair trade and I'm big into fair trade. And so each each plate had a lot of significance and each one, you can get it on my blog. If you go to my blog and type um, through my website, amybeola.com, type in Prince William, the whole menu will come up and the CNN article will come up. And then um, everything had, was paired with a wine and it was paired with a non-alcoholic drink as unique drink as well, because you know when you're those level state type dinners, you, you have people who don't drink and you have to be um, equally accommodating to them. And, that's one of the things that I learned uh, in my career in working with embassies was was making meals that kind of fit for everybody. So it, it got you know I got they printed it. I got good reviews and I was happy. But I rem I remember reading one of the one of the readers who commented on the article and they said, you know, how come my menu wasn't just Mediterranean like the Chinese chef with a Chinese menu? And I said, because my my menu was about them. It wasn't about me. And, I, and, I, and that's very, and then in, later on in life, I realized I was like, well, that's very true of the Mediterranean. Like you're, you're more worried about your guests and making them happy than you are about forcing like, this is my food and you have to like it. It's, and to this day, when I accompanied chefs from Capri to the, to the James Beard Foundation, and we did an event there a couple of years ago, there was one gentleman who had a very uh, strict diet. We actually had to go out and buy a special cut of meat because he could only have that. And, you know, he signed up for the dinner, but then he had this prohibitive diet. But the, the, the chef from Capri was like, you know, that's what he can eat. That's what we're going to do. it. And he, he sat back up to the dining room and he said, ask that gentleman how he wants his meat cooked. And the guy was floored because he said, here's this, you know, really well-renowned chef asking me how I want my 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 uh, steak cooked and I was translating for the for the chef from Capri. And he said, of course, why would I not? It's his steak, he's gonna be the one that eats it. But that's one of the key elements, you know? Well, that's that's sort of the Italian table, the Jewish table, right. you know, you know, eat, you know, we, we yeah. want you to be happy. Right. You know, the more you eat, the happier we are. Exactly. So we go along with that. You are, um, there was a quote on one of the recent videos, videos, and you said smelling food helps digestion. Correct. How so? So there is this book. It was it was produced by the person who then was in charge of the Cornell Food and Brand Lab, Dr. Brian Wansick, and it's called Mindless Eating. And there's all this wonderful research about you know, tips about food and the way that we eat it, and they found that if not only smelling it being prepared, but also listening to food being described. 10 to 15, 20 minutes before you eat it really helps to eat less, eat better foods, absorb more nutrients in what you're eating, digest the food more slowly. So there's something sensory chemical that goes on within our bodies that when we're smelling food, it's very good for us. And we actually eat less. And, I, and my layman's way of, of uh, describing it to people is that our senses are being satisfied. And, I, you know, when we were just out in wilderness, we were constantly around food and there were, there were things around us. And so that was a part of our life. But now a lot of people work in offices or in, in areas where there's no food. And so your brain is thinking it's going to starve. It's like, where am I going to get that next meal from? Because we don't see it around us. And right. but when we smell it and when we see it, we're more like it's contrary to belief, to common belief, because I think people say, oh, I can't look at food because I'm on a diet or I can't think about food. It's actually the opposite. The more we look at it and the more we think about it, especially if it's, you know, healthful and nutritious, like the better, the better off it'll be. I, I could go into a whole thing there, but I think, um, I think by smelling it, you know, if you're cooking, that sense, it brings me back to me smelling homemade chicken soup oh. is a comfort that I know from growing up. So there's an emotional attachment to these aromas as well as 
tantalizing, you know, you start thinking about that food and that you had it. So you're, you're halfway digested. Yes. It, I understand. I just thought that was really interesting. And you get a uh, sense of comfort, you know, it's, if it's associated with a happy memory, you get a sense of comfort that nothing else can replace. And I think that's the power of cooking is that we can recreate that for ourselves whenever we want. We have a couple things, questions here. Um, sure. Cindy, uh, just sign up for jmoreliving.com to get their newsletter. Great. Or sign up for Jmore Living on Facebook. And notifications come out every Wednesday. She wants to know how she can learn about upcoming interviews. And there is... Uh, 135 episodes on video <laughs> in the archives accessible so you can dig back there and watch any of the previous shows this will go to video immediately after the show airs um, Randy Rahm my girlfriend who has extreme food allergies she says the chef that is aware accepting of food allergies is a rare find the Mediterranean diet though it's great for a lot of people with food sensitivities. And Cindy says, yes, follow, uh, somebody responded to um, Jen, the producer, to her about following us. So um, I can listen to you. You're, you, you draw me in. Your knowledge is just insane. Um, we just celebrated February 13th was National Italian Food Day. What did you eat that day? Well, I, I was on Fox 5 in D.C. on a show called Lying in the Kitchen, um, which is a really fun, it's a top-rated cooking show in D.C. And so I brought a whole bunch of goodies for them. We made heart-shaped ravioli caprese, which are a special kind of ravioli made with a dough that's no eggs, just uh, water and uh, boiling water and flour. And then I filled them with um, whole ricotta cheese, a little bit of parmigiano reggiano, provola, and marjoram, fresh marjoram, which is traditional on the island of Capri. And I made a, a tomato sauce to go on top of those. We did that on TV. And then um, I also did heart-shaped focaccia. And because it was National Italian Food Day, I, I decorated the top with the Italian flag. So one part was with arugula, one part was with mozzarella, one part was with tomatoes. And I had a heart, I always, every Valentine's Day, and I make my heartbeat salad. So it was any green you like, but I used arugula that day. And then I roasted beets and I, I stamped hearts out of the beets uh, to put on top. I drizzled that with uh, my private label olive oil and vinegar. And then for, for dessert, we had chocolate olive oil uh, mini cakes and also something called quattro quarti, which is an Italian pound cake made with, uh, with some cherries in it and some heart shaped uh, sweet red wine and um, olive oil tarali crunchy cookies. So that was that was the menu for for that day, and I ate it. I ate it twice. <laughs> I'm I'm sure they were very happy at the studio having done food styling and done my own segments. If you don't have enough food there for the staff, because they all swarm the moment you're off air. Yeah, and that's like, you know, but I, I wish they would leave that on because everybody lines up and you're like serving it up. That's literally my favorite part of being on TV. <laughs> right. You mentioned. Um, your products. You have a fairly new adventure called venture called Amy Riolo Selections. Correct. Um, tell us more about it, and people can learn about it at amyriolo.com. Uh, but a, a little clip. Go for it. Amy Riolo Selections came out in 2019, and the idea was I had been traveling uh, to Italy with the Italian trade agency to go to meetings. Um, you know, taking olive oil classes, going to the consortium for olive oil meetings. It's called Unaprol in Italy. And I learned a lot about olive oil. And because I was already a Mediterranean diet advocate, I was always telling people good olive oil, good olive oil. But then, you know, I realized so many people were asking me, what is good olive oil? And the more I started to learn, the more I realized there was to learn. So it became a new religion to me. And my... Um, a, a dear friend who I was also teaching cooking classes at his place said, you know, why don't you have your own line? You should have your own olive oil because I was always selling my friend's olive oil and holding it up. And so I said, I would love to, but I don't know how to import. I don't know how to distribute. He said, I'm an importer. I'm a distributor. You have the relationships with the people that are making the best quality stuff in Italy. Talk to them. Um, 
you know, develop your products, figure out what you want, and then I'll help you to import it. And so we did. And so now there is actually a gift box. You can get it at detalia.com. If you put my name in the discount code, you can get a 10% uh, discount and there's free shipping. And I have four of my own private label products. So we first came out with the olive oil. This is a single estate olive oil. It's made from two particular uh, cultivars of olives called the um, Gentili di Chietti and the Intoso, which are from Abruzzo in Italy, They're only grown there. And um, I blended it to like my flavor profile. Of course, every harvest is different. It's like wine, but um, I wanted to choose very low acidity, which means high quality and olive oil. And I wanted it to be pretty high phenolic, but still have a great taste and that you could use on many different things. And so this was the first, first product that we came out with. And then um, I'm also a very good friend of, of this company called Anfoso. So my friend Alessandro Anfoso also makes olive oil in Liguria, Italy, with Tajasca olives. But Liguria is the home of the pesto. So we also have a full line of pestos. So we came up with the sun-dried red pesto, which is, it has Parmigiano-Reggiano and the pine nuts and the sun-dried tomatoes and his olive oil, which is amazing. And that was our second. And then the third product, which marries really well with the... Um, olive oil is this vinegar. It's called a white balsamic. So technically the Aceto Balsamic di Modena um, DOP or IGP are not white. They, they are blended with Lambrusco grapes and Trebbiano and that's the traditional balsamic. This is not the traditional one. This one is made only with the Trebbiano grape to make it to, so that it stays white, which um, has a very sweet flavor. So this is only great must in here. There's no um, caramel, there's no sugar, there's no additives to make it sweet, but it is very sweet. It tastes like almost like a combination between your best vinegar and honey. So you could put it on scallops or strawberries or avocado, anything you want, it's really good. And then the fourth product uh, and, and my most recent one that's with my label are these, um, Macaroni Pugliesi, which are a shape of kind of elongated curly fusilli made by request with 100% Senatore Capelli flour, which is an ancient uh, wheat that is very healthy, naturally low gluten content. And um, those are those are my four. And it has three other amazing products in there, too. Okay. And I just want to tell people that at some point you had told me or I that... Um, there are at least over 500 different pastas made from the various regions of Italy. Just okay. a little trivia, everyone. Yeah. Um, um, I can I can keep talking, but I want to get to my questions, and I don't want to take up much more of your time that I end the show with. And um, what was your best bite this week? That's a tough one. <laughs> uh, probably all of the things that I made on TV on Tuesday because they're labor intensive and I don't make them often but those ravioli and the heart-shaped focaccia were probably definitely my favorite things okay if you could go back and give your 18 year old self a piece of advice what would it be not to worry so much that things will work out the way that they're supposed to and and you'll be surprised although so many knows uh, turn into be um, beautiful yeses. Okay. If you wake up tomorrow with a new talent, what would it be? I would have a beautiful voice to sing with, beautiful singing voice. I love a to sing, you sing, but it's my voice. It's just not beautiful. I just sing anyway. But it would be nice to have the, the good voice to go along with all of the enthusiasm. <laughs> So you would sing in public as averse exactly. to singing in the car like me or singing, right. you know, alone. I sit there and I go, and I even hear it and I go, <laughs> so off key. But many, many people choose to sing. Sure. Um, and you have such a varied background. And I'm going to ask you this and there are more things that we can talk about. What didn't I ask you that I probably should have? I think this interview was so great that I um, I don't really I don't think you missed anything. Um, I would like to mention my my tours. Cindy mentioned Greece, and so those tours are run uh, with a different company than I do Italy with. So Greece and Morocco I do with a wonderful company called Indigo Gazelle Tours. With my friend Alex Safos, and uh, these tours are also different in that you get your friends and family or coworkers together. 
put together a small group and then we take the whole group together. We, we custom design the tour for you in Morocco or uh, uh, in Greece in, on the island of Icaria, which we love. Terrific, uh -huh. terrific. Well, I want to thank you so much, everybody, amyriolo.com. And thank you. Oh, Jeffrey's just sent in a note. Where can I find your products? Did not see them on your website. Sure. So if you go to my website on the homepage and uh, scroll down to the different blog posts, uh, you'll see the products there. But you can they're all available at detalia.com. And that's spelled D-I-T-A-L-I-A dot com. And so uh, let's see. Well, Faith Riolo, Amy's olive oil and her white vinegar are the best on the planet. Absolutely delicious. There's no nepotism there, Faith no. Riolo. <laughs> I don't want to miss any of these my questions. Mom. That's my mom, but she's my worst critic. So if they were not good, she would tell you, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, we have to make plans, maybe meet in Colombia. Oh, I would love We can meet at Busboys and Poets. Say hi to my friend Andy Shalal. Okay, that's over in Colombia? Yes. Okay, we can do that. We'll, we'll talk in a little bit. Cool. You're the one with the busy schedule. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I love this time. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Ciao. Ciao. Okay, everyone. So uh, Amy and I can talk forever. She's fascinating and you never get bored. She's just so bright and illuminating. Next week's guest will be Brian Bernstein, marketing manager for Savile Foods, a broad, line, a broad line food service distribution company in Maryland, Virginia, Washington, D.C., and Delaware. He is the past chairman of the board of the Restaurant Association's Education Foundation and a current board member of the Restaurant Association of Maryland. He is the past culinary advisor on the board for DC Central Kitchen. He's a CIA graduate from working the line to management. We will be talking numerous culinary career paths one can take. You can see everything that Amy has done. There are many, many and uh, his was from, you know, working the line to being up there and, and being on many of these boards, even culinary schools. He's fascinating. So tune in next week. Just a reminder, the new February issue of Jay Moore magazine is out. So those local in Baltimore, check the food stores in different locations. The free magazines are there. Or you can go to jmoreliving.com. And you can look for the new February issue. If you click on it, then it has the magazine. You can look at it there. And while you're there, look up my latest story was, my latest story is, not was, <laughs> is Blame It on the Bossa Nova. I'm not going to go into any depth, but it's the romance February issue. So check it out. And if there's anyone you'd like to see me interview, please let me know. You can reach me at food at jmoreliving.com. That is my email. Or on Instagram at Dara Cooks. All shows are immediately archived in video form on jmore's Facebook page and jmoreliving.com, which you can see right behind me. Feel free to dig into our video archives of past shows. We truly appreciate it when you share our show with friends and family. It helps it grow. May your plates always, always remain full. Thank you, and we'll see you next Thursday.